Good morning. Welcome in the name of our Savior Jesus to worship here at Living Shepherd. It's a joy to gather together with you this morning. We're continuing our worship here in the season of Advent with under the theme, He is Coming. So we're preparing, not just for the celebration of the Savior's birth, but also we're looking ahead to His coming again on the last day. And that really is the focus of our worship today. We'll talk about what it means to prepare your hearts for the Savior's coming. It means recognizing who that Savior is and what He does for you and what comfort that gives you every day and into eternity. May God bless your worship this morning. We welcome all those who are joining us online. We're so glad you're with us this morning. Even if you can't be here in person with us, it's a joy to gather together with you as well. If you're joining us online, we'd love it if you'd leave a comment. Let us know that you're worshiping with us this morning, even if that comment is just your name. It's good for us to see who we gather together with and to know how we can serve you better. If you're looking for our worship folder, you can find that on our church website, livingshepherd.com. If you go to the Alive and Growing tab, you'll see a heading there for worship. If you click on that heading, you'll be taken to a page where there's a button for you to download our worship folder. We begin this morning on page 3. We'll have our invocation and the gathering rite. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, if we claim to be without sin, therefore, let us each confess our sins to our holy faithful and merciful Lord. Almighty God, I have sinned against you and am no longer worthy to be called your child. Yet in mercy you sacrificed your only Son to take away my guilt and sin. For his sake, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner, 
and in the joy of your Holy Spirit, let me serve you all my days. confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Upon this, your confession, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. We light two Advent candles remembering Jesus, who continues to come to us through word and sacrament. He is the word incarnate, the fulfillment of all God's promises to his people. Come, O long-expected Jesus, born to set your people free. From our sins and fears release us by your death on Calvary. Hope to all the earth Dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. You'll notice how these verses are fulfilled in our gospel this morning. It was a prophecy, a promise of the coming preparer, John the Baptist, the one who would prepare the way for the Savior. But this prophecy also reminds us of what the Savior himself will do. We can't save ourselves but our Savior comes to give himself to save us. Our first reading from Isaiah 40. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, In the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, Here is your God. 
See, the sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This is the word of our God. Our next hymn is hymn 16. It's printed for you on page 6. On Jordan's bank, the Baptist cry. We'll sing hymn 16 together. Out of respect for the words and works of Christ, please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for this second Sunday of Advent is from Mark chapter 1, the first eight verses. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Our next hymn is hymn 12. Hark the glad sound, the Savior comes. We'll sing hymn 12 together.
The portion of God's word that we'll use for our sermon this morning is from Peter's second letter, chapter 3, verses 8 through 14. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless blameless, and at peace with him. This is the word of our God. There is nothing as near and dear to our hearts in this country as the American dream. Right? It's this idea, even more than that, it's, it's this fundamental notion that has shaped our country this guiding principle that is sometimes used to even promote and elevate our country. America is the land of opportunity, we say. The land of freedom and personal independence. We, we say it to our college students as they're contemplating colleges and careers or the trades. We proclaim it to people who are maybe repressed and a little bitter, right? Who are thinking about a career change. And we even carve it on our statues and on our memorials, telling the whole world that what set these people apart, what sets this country apart, are these lofty notions of freedom and opportunity. And then we come crashing back down to the bitter ground of race riots and social injustice and economic inequality. Poverty, crime, greed. And maybe we start to, to wonder if we've gotten it all wrong. If we've been pushing and promoting the wrong things this whole time. Freedom, opportunity, do these things even exist like we think they do? In our reading this morning, Peter asks a startling question. And maybe it's a question that for us as Americans is, a, is especially hard to handle. Because Peter doesn't ask, what do you want to be? Right? Like the American idea, we can do, we can say, we can like, we can be anything we want to be. No, Peter asks a different question. He says, what kind of people ought you to be? That's an entirely different perspective, isn't it? It's not so much about freedom or opportunity, but it's about responsibility. See, Peter is getting at a bigger and far more important issue in this reading. He doesn't, he's not so concerned about how we can live a peaceful and stable life in this society, in this world, in this country. He's concerned about our hearts, the state of our spiritual lives whether or not we are prepared for eternity. And you've probably noticed that that's a familiar theme in church this time of year. We're in the season of Advent where we're preparing for the birth of our Savior, preparing for Christmas, but it's so much more than just making sure the decorations are hung and all the shopping is done. Because the Savior who comes as a baby in Bethlehem is also the Savior who comes on the last day as a judge. So we aren't just preparing for a holiday. We're preparing for an eternity. 
And then that's clearly part of the focus of, of Peter's letter, and especially of these verses. When, when Peter asks that question, what kind of people ought you to be? It's with the understanding that the last day is coming, that this world with its race riots and with its social injustice and with its, its global pandemics is going away. Are we ready for this? Are we prepared? I don't have to tell you that the teaching of the last day has been met with more than a little skepticism over the years. It was there in Peter's day. It was there before Jesus was even born. In fact, since God's perfect creation of the world and then the terrible and awful fall into sin, there have always been people who have echoed the same refrain. Last day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard that before. People keep talking about it, but it never seems to come. And even more than that, there's been people who aren't so much skeptical as just downright disbelieving. What? Last day? Yeah, right. That's just a made-up idea to scare people into to doing what others want. But you notice, Peter doesn't really leave the question up for debate, does he? And even when he starts to give a few details about what this last day will be like, the destruction, the fire, the roaring, the melting, Peter doesn't dwell on those details. He goes right to the heart of the matter and says, are you prepared? Are you ready? So let's talk about what it means to be prepared. There's a, a familiar term, French term actually, in the world of cooking. And believe me, I didn't know this off the top of my head. I had to look this up. But it's used to describe preparation. And my French is not very good. In fact, it's non-existent. But I think it's pronounced mise en place. Does anyone know French? Am I saying that right? Mise en place. So it's quite simply that just means preparation. Right? But the interesting thing about that phrase is that it can be used as a noun, as a verb, and even as an idea. So when it's used as a noun, it refers to all the ingredients, all the supplies that you need for a particular meal or to make a particular dish. That's mise en place, everything you need. When it's used as a verb, it refers to the actual process of gathering all of these things, of, of putting all of those ingredients and supplies where you need them for when you need them. That's mise en place too. But most interesting... That phrase can be used to describe an idea. It's this understanding of everything that goes into preparation. It's actually a state of mind. And that's really what Peter is getting at in our reading this morning. He's talking about our state of mind, our spiritual state of mind. Are we ready? Are we prepared for the last day? And doing that involves a critical thing that Peter talks about here. It means recognizing the huge difference between God and us. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So plain and simple, God's timing is not our timing. And maybe you think that that's not very hard to deal with, right? Maybe it's only skeptics that have trouble dealing with that, but think of how hard that truth can be in your life when you've had to have weeks or even months of cancer treatments. Think of how hard that can be when you've prayed so long and so hard for a spouse or for that better job or for the end of your financial hardships. Think of how hard that truth can be when you watch classmates and, and friends die. And then you sit back and you wonder, how long is my time going to be on this earth? God's timing is not our timing. And part of preparing for the last day means humbly acknowledging how little control we actually have. We can't stop the sun from rising. We can't stop the sun from setting. And we can't keep the last day from coming. 
God's timing is not our timing. Why not tomorrow? Why not today? Why not right now? God's timing is not our timing. And that's a good thing. Because it's designed to foster trust in a God who does more than simply just pick a random day off the calendar. Listen to how Peter describes God's timing. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. This is also part of preparation, is noticing this huge difference between us and God. God's motivation is so much better so much purer than ours. It is so easy for me to get all wrapped up in myself and my own feelings and, and my own experiences in, in, in doing what I want to do, in saying what I want to say, in, in liking what I want to like, in being what I want to be because it's good for me. And maybe that's why it's so hard for us to prepare for the last day. Because I like to think that I know exactly what God should do. And if I were him, I'd make sure this global pandemic was gone. And I'd make sure my suffering was over. And, I, and I'd make sure that all those skeptics and, and doubters out there would suffer for their unbelief. That's what I would do. But this is God. He's patient. With everyone. But most especially with me. When it seems like God is maybe slow or hesitant or indecisive, He's not at all. He's actually unquestionably devoted to me. Preparing for the last day means understanding how gracious God is. Even when I am, am selfish and cruel and cold, God wants me to repent. He wants me to confess my sins and then to know that they're all forgiven in Jesus. And God wants this for the whole world. So Peter talks about how God makes that happen. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. See how different God is in action than we are. And that's really the heart of grace, isn't it? When I understand that I'm inconsistent and unreliable and corrupt and wicked and sinful, God is consistent. God is reliable. God is faithful. God is true. He keeps His promises. If you track God's promises throughout history, you're going to find an astounding record. A, a serpent crusher for Adam and Eve? Check. A blessing for the whole world through Abraham's offspring? Check. A king from David who would battle sin, who would rule over death, who would give us peace? Check. A baby born of a virgin, destined to live and die and rise again? Check. All fulfilled in Christ, our Savior. There is actually only one promise that God has left to fulfill. And that's His promise to take us to our eternal home in heaven. And maybe that promise will be fulfilled on the last day, or maybe it will be fulfilled before then in God's good and, and loving timing. But no matter what, no matter when, we can be sure that Christ has prepared us for it. Because He lived and died and rose again for us. We are prepared. We are ready in Christ. When the French use that term, mise en place, they don't mean to imply that 
all of these ingredients and all of these supplies will somehow magically and spontaneously cook themselves into a miraculous dinner. Not at all. There's still actual cooking to be done, right? But the hard part, the most important part, the preparation has been done. Being prepared for the last day doesn't mean that we simply sit back or lay down or just wait for God to fulfill His timing. There's still work to be done. By God's grace, we are prepared for that last day. We, we daily and we humbly confess our sins, the sins that we see in our hearts and our lives, and we trust God's love and grace in Christ. We do that daily, but then we also get to live out this preparation. And that's what Peter talks about in our reading as he, he talks about what kind of people we ought to be. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. So what kind of people ought you to be, ought we to be? Until that day when God decides to move us to our eternal home in heaven, we get to live out this preparation that Christ has done for us by expecting that day to come at any time. Right? So, so we continue to humbly confess our sins and to rejoice in God's forgiveness, trusting that, that Christ and His grace sustains us through it all. We get to live out this preparation that Christ has done for us by looking forward to that day, by actually praying for it to come soon. Because we understand that this world offers us nothing but temporary tears and sorrow. We get to live out this preparation that Christ has done for us by living holy and godly lives. Echoing the same patience, the same love that God has proclaimed to us. And so we serve and we support each other and we reach out to others, holding out this promise of something so much better to come. And then we get to live out this preparation that Christ has done for us by holding tight to it, to the spotless and blameless comfort of the cross. Because in the end, and on the last day, that really is the only source of comfort and confidence and peace that we can have in this life. Amen. Please stand. Now may God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Let's now confess our Christian faith together with the words of the Nicene Creed printed for you on page 8. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we will gather our thank offering. We still aren't able to pass an offering plate. However, there is a plate on the chair in the back. If you're so moved, you may drop your offering in that plate at any time. If you're a guest or a visitor with us this morning, joining us either in person or online, please know that you are not obligated to give. Your offerings and your gifts certainly are appreciated, but we're just happy to have you here and to share the Word of God with you. This is one of the ways that we get to work together as a congregation to take this good news of Jesus out into our community. During this time for the offering, this time of reflection, it's a great opportunity if you're joining us online to once again leave a comment. Let us know that you're worshiping with us. And also make sure you stay connected with us as a congregation. You can like us and follow us on Facebook. And you can also sign up on our church website for weekly or daily devotional emails. At this time, we have the privilege of welcoming some new members to our church family here, so we'll invite the mailing family to come forward. Dear members of Living Shepherd Evangelical Lutheran Church, Justin and Veronica and Judge, having been baptized and instructed in the teachings of the Word of God, desire to become members of this congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him on earth. You have come before this congregation to declare your faith and to unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your hearts to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. I do. do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the Word of God? If so, answer, I do. I do. do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, be diligent in the use of God's Word and sacraments, and lead a godly life even to death? If so, answer, I do and I ask God to help me. I do and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work our Lord has given to this congregation? If so, answer, I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. 
Having heard your promises, we, the members of Living Shepherd Evangelical Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love and invite you to share in our worship and mission in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please stand for prayer at the place for special prayers this morning. We'll ask the Lord God to bless the mailing family as they join us. May they be a blessing to us, and may we be a blessing to them. We pray. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of Lords. Gracious God, we thank you for the faith and trust that you have given to the mailing family. Continue to feed and strengthen that faith through the powerful working of your word. Lead them to daily focus on your grace and forgiveness in Jesus. Help them to trust you in all things, remembering your promise to work all things for their eternal good. And move them to live your love, to be active and faithful Christians, and to find a fulfilling and joyful home in our congregation. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We continue now with the preparation for Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Through his holy prophets, he promised a king to bring light to those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Once again, this morning, celebrate continual distribution of Lord's Supper. So that means you may come forward in the center aisle and come up as a family group to receive Lord's Supper. Uh, you do not feel the need to stay here at the table. You can move on and, and take uh, the bread and the wine. I will continue to repeat the words of distribution as we go. Come, for all things are now ready. Receive now with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. This true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will strengthen and preserve you and keep you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Our service now continues with the prayer that is printed for you on page 12. Please stand. 
Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. may be seated. Good morning once again to all of you. It's a joy to gather together as we prepare our hearts for our Savior's coming at Christmas, but also for the last day, which is the ultimate fulfillment of all God's promises, taking us home to heaven. May God bless you as you continue to prepare for His coming. A um, couple quick announcements for you. First of all, thank you to all those who helped set up and sanitize our worship space this morning. Thank you to Sarah for playing, and thank you to Ada for handling our technology this morning. And thank you to you, too, for gathering together with us. It's good to be here with you. Um, in the bulletin, you'll see our usual page uh, pointing out the words to study for this week, a Bible passage to think about, pray about, maybe even to memorize, 2 Peter 3, 13 to 14. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. And the wonderful thing about that is that really doesn't require a lot of effort on your part, does it? Jesus is the one who has made you spotless and blameless and at peace with God. So hold tight to him today and every day. You can see the ways to serve, and then also for our prayers this week, uh, we're going to ask the Lord for the strength to humbly repent trusting in Jesus' forgiveness. Also pray for the Lord's continued blessings on the sale of our church land. So far, the schedule is, is on track. We're scheduled to close December 9th on the sale of the church land. So everything seems to be going, going good with that. And then we'll also pray for all those families who, who might especially be struggling with difficulty at this time. Uh, the Ogle family, we mentioned this last week, Vivian has been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, so we'll keep them in our prayers. The Oswig family, Dolores Oswig, was called to eternal home just a little over a week ago. Um, and then Johnny, too, as she continues to have treatments. Are there any other prayers that we want to add? Because we'll, we'll have some special prayers right now. I will include one. Uh, I have a good, classmate, a good friend, a classmate of mine from the seminary who's a pastor in St. Joseph, Michigan. A couple months ago, we prayed for his dad who was diagnosed with cancer. Um, he completed his treatments, and then just this week, he uh, got pneumonia. So he's in the hospital with pneumonia. Um, so we're going to ask the Lord to bless their whole family. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much 
for how you have prepared us for the final day. With, with the comfort of Christ, we have no reason to fear or worry. We know that our eternal home is secure. Um, and now we just wait your gracious and good and loving timing. While we are here on earth, we, we definitely have times where we go through struggles and difficulties. And so today especially, we pray for all those who are having trouble and difficulty. We pray for the Ogle family, for Johnny, for the Oswig family, and also for Pastor Jesse Knox and his family. Continue to strengthen and comfort all of these, your people, with the comfort of your promises. Help us to look and see clearly what our Savior has done for us and how that changes our lives now and forever. Bless us all so that we continue to hold tight to the spotless and blameless comfort that Christ has given us. In your name we pray. Amen. You can also see our November offering summary there, too. Uh, so just a few things about this coming week. As, as we've been mentioning, our women's Bible study is taking a break until after the holidays. Uh, our answers to life's most important questions is also kind of taking a break. We finished up classes with, with these various groups, but that doesn't mean you, you, you have to stop inviting people to learn more about Jesus or about our church. Um, I'm certainly willing to schedule those classes whenever. So if you know of someone who might be interested, let me know or, or invite them and tell them that I'd be happy to meet with them. Uh, we are still working on our holiday meals. Uh, we've got, I think, enough meals for about four families right now. Um, and we made contact with those families earlier this week. Uh, but we also have let those people know that we may be able to provide even more meals. So if you're still interested in donating to that, or if you know of a particular family that would also benefit, please let us know. Uh, we hope to deliver those meals probably next week, but even the week after, um, just to make sure we get that to them in time for Christmas. Yes, Leo, did you have something? <laughs> yeah, and I should mention that, right? So we certainly thank and praise God for the blessing of the mailing family. It's a joy to have you together here with us. Um, and they have candy. So if you can answer those questions correctly, you can talk to them about having candy. Now, I should, I should say this. This is actually their candy. So if they decide to say, we'll just give you a pat on the back for getting the questions right, well, that's up to them. All right? So, if you haven't met Justin and Veronica and Judge, please introduce yourself and, and visit with them after worship here today. Um, I also wanted to, to point out the Advent devotion books, uh, a great resource for you to have Advent devotions in your home with your family. Uh, there's a bunch on the table back there. Take as many as you need for your family. I can always print more of them. Um, and then just looking ahead to our Christmas schedule, keep in mind that December 20th, at our usual Sunday time for worship, is our family Christmas worship program. So different families will be helping us uh, with that Christmas worship, and they'll be leading different parts of the service. So hope you're able to join us for that. And then obviously you can see, too, we're worshiping on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day as well. Anything I'm forgetting... Or anything I need to bring up right now? All right, well, you're welcome to stick around. We've got a, an extra time to grow together in God's Word. Adults and teens will be here studying, hopefully, maybe, what is the last lesson of our uh, church and state Bible study, how a Christian lives under both a state and the church. Um, and then kids are invited to stick around. They're working on special crafts for that family Christmas program. Uh, and they'll also be maybe even decorating a Christmas tree. We'll see. All right. If there's nothing else, then the Lord bless you this week and always. As he has prepared your heart for that final day, continue to hold tight to him. Have a great week.